Hey everyone. So this week's lecture, we're focusing on stems. And so that's form and anatomy. But we'll also look at twigs. These can be really useful features for tree identification. And so we'll talk about, in this short lecture, we'll talk about um, stems and what they are, different tree growth forms, which can be a diagnostic, uh, the function and anatomy, and also some bark features. And so we have a cartoon from The Giving Tree, one of my least favorite children's stories. Um, and I love Shel Stilverstein too. So today's tree trivia to start out. What is the large, tallest species of tree on earth and where does it grow? Okay, so the answer is coast redwood, Sequoia sempervirens. This is a tree we'll learn later this semester. And the tallest actual tree is named Hyperion and it's 379.7 feet tall. Pretty amazing, grows in the North, uh, Northern California coast. And um, main limitation on tree height, Curious what your response is to this. This is a non-graded question. So the limitation to tree height is water availability. If you can imagine um, when water flows up the tree in the vascular tissue, it needs to reach the leaves in the upper surfaces. And so it, that's fighting gravity. And as you get farther from the ground, that, that act of transport is difficult. And so we'll learn that in the Pacific Northwest where a coast redwood is prevalent in its range, it has a lot of fog drip, which ends up providing a lot of water for that tree. And so that allows that tree to continue to grow, um, despite the fact that the vascular tissue is, is less efficient in transporting water up the stem. And so you can see the, um, this is the Coast Redwood range and showing the historic range of Coast Redwood in the darker green color. We'll talk about this more later this semester when we talk about forest types in North America. And just a magnificent tall tree. Okay, so when we're talking about stems, we're talking about the primary axis or the trunk of the tree. So something that we, we often call the trunk, but um, bowl is also a, a more acceptable term. Uh, I try not to use the word trunk, but it's something that comes naturally to all of us. It's an intuitive stem. And I have a couple of um, just interesting stats for some tree species that have notable stems. So we've already learned tulip tree and yellow poplar, and um, also looking at tree diameters, right? So you can measure superlatives in a number of different ways. You can measure height, stem diameter. Um, certainly there are stem diameters larger. American chestnut used to have diameters to 17 feet before it was wiped out by chestnut blight. That was the largest diameter tree in the east. And there are certainly some 10 foot plus diameter tulip trees uh, in Western North Carolina and other, other places where they've been protected. But sycamores and elms can also get quite large. This is a um, photograph from Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest of my forest ecosystems class. And this is a really beautiful and giant tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera with our class a couple of years ago. So um, when we talk about tree growth forms, they can be um, indicative as well. And so you can have an X current, right? This is a tree that has a central leader. So this is a term you need to know where there's a single stem and, and the main branches come off that stem. And then you have D current, sometimes called deliquescent, where there's multiple scaffold branches. So if you look at the growth form for that second decurrent or deliquescent tree, you'll see that the tree forks and it continues to fork. And so it has a spreading kind of growth form. So let's look at some examples of that. So X current trees, um, we have, I think it's tulip tree, uh, Liriodendron on the far left, and then white pine, I think in the center and red maple on the far right. So you can see it pretty clearly, there's a central stem and then the main branches come all, all come off that central stem. And so sometimes this ends up making kind of a triangle shape, right, where it um, tapers towards the top. And then tree growth forms when you have decurrent or the other word that might be hidden by my screen is deliquescent leaf or growth form. So you can see that the, the tree branches and splits early and then continues to split. So um, Looking at the tree on the far left, I can't remember which one that is, but then we have um, American elm, I believe, and 
another and we'll see this spreading form right so you have to look for a central stem you should, if you're trying to figure out the tree growth form you always want to look at that central stem and see does it go straight up with tree limbs branching off of it or do the um, does the tree continue to split and divide into that decurrent or deliquescent shape and so these trees tend to have rounder um, more spreading canopy it's kind of like that lollipop shape that we all drew is when we were kids. So um, this is going to be in my way. Um, the growth form for crown shape and competition. It's funny. Let's see if I can stop my video. I can't. Okay. Maybe this will be out of the way. Um, so the tree growth form, right? So the crown shape is a function of competition, right? Competition for light. And um, when we're talking about tree growth, you can think about trees compete in different spheres. One is through roots and others through shoots, right? So root, roots need space in the ground versus shoots that need space to get light. And trees can also take on different growth forms if they're in open conditions versus forested conditions. And this can also be a function of the stand age. And so I have a diagram on the far right of your screen looking at the canopy height of different forest types and it looks at the leaf area distribution. So where are the leaves in these canopies? And then looking at light intensity, also looking at um, also as a function of height. So if you look at um, the top example, right, the canopy structure, when you have a very structured forest, this could be the case of an old growth forest where you have some mature trees, you have understory, and then a pretty developed understory, and maybe even herb layer, right? You can see the leaf area distribution peaks at the canopy, right? So the, the canopy is fairly full of leaves. And then um, there's a second peak for understory trees and the light intensity decreases as you head towards the forest floor. So these are our dark shady forests like um, the photo I showed you of Joyce Kilmer a few minutes ago. You can have an even aged forest and this is the case for our pine plantations and um, pine forests tend to have a, a pretty even aged structure or it could be any um, mid-aged forest that's been cut or timbered. And so you have a canopy height that is, you know, where most of the growth occurs in the similar height, uh, where there is an even aged canopy, but not a whole lot in the understory. And so you can see the leaf area is distributed in a much narrower band um, and you still have fairly more open conditions, um, definitely not as dark on the forest floor if you look at the forest floor and compared to the one at the top. And then finally, we have a um, kind of an intermediate case where you've got a developed uh, overstory and then understory. So this could be, this might be a good example for um, a Piedmont forest that was clear cut or abandoned from agriculture, or maybe during the time of the depression, and you've had a canopy grow up that's fairly even aged, but there's been enough time for an understory forest to develop. And then you can see really two um, peaks in terms of leaf area distribution. And then um, these can be pretty light and open forests if you're looking at sunlight that's reaching the forest floor. So stem function, right? So what do, what do these stems or bowls do, right? So they provide structure and support for the leaves. So they, they get the leaves up into the sunshine where they need to be. And they also have vascular tissue in them. So uh, this might be review from your high school biology class, but the xylem um, carry water and nutrients to the crown. Um, so that xylem is present inside the stem and then they, the phloem carries photosynthate from the leaves. So that's transporting sugars um, up to, um, to the rest of the tree. And also these um, stems store water and food. So in compounds, right, they build wood over time. So you can see this kind of flow in the tree diagram here that you've got roots that, that pull in water through osmosis and then there's active transport that are conducted through the sapwood, um, which is the xylem tissue. There's, we'll see that there's um, live sapwood and then dead sapwood. And then you've got um, the phloem, which carries the photosynthate from the leaves for the organic processes in the tree. So. Um, the carbohydrates are ended up being used all over the tree. And then you've also got the stem providing a lot of support and um, that also protects the tree from storms. They can be, they're pretty flexible. 
but they um, in wind and then also get the leaves up to into the canopy. So let's look at woody stem anatomy really quick if we do a cross section. And this is a lot less detail than you'll have in a class like Dr. Preslin's um, wood anatomy. But um, looking at the heartwood, so this is the xylem tissue that is non-functional, right? So this is added on layer by layer. And you can see in the, so that's in the very center. And then you've got the sapwood that's got functioning xylem, right? Transporting water and nutrients up to the crown. And then the phloem is in this inner bark. So there's, a, there's another layer called the vascular cambium. And then the inner bark or phloem is, is transporting that photosynthate, um, that, those carbohydrates all over the tree to where they need to go. And then you have a layer of outer bark. And so all of these, right, when we talk about inner bark, we might talk about a color for that for a particular tree for identification. So bark is actually pretty, can be pretty useful for tree identification. Um, as trees age and mature. It is um, interesting that, that trees at the very earliest stages, the bark is not especially useful for identification unless it has certain features. And then as trees get much older, um, some of the trees in Joyce Kilmer, they, they tend to start to have very similar looking bark. But in the intermediate stage, they can be very useful. Most bark starts out smooth. So if you find a young twig or a sapling, it may not have bark that's very distinguishable. But we can use, you know, bark is, we don't have technical terms really, but we have a lot of descriptive terms that we use. So we might call um, bark smooth. We might describe it as ridged, fibrous. Sometimes bark falls or is divided into plates. It can be scaly. It can be cobbled. Um, sometimes we, there's some oaks that we describe as having ski trails, so flattened, um, smooth ridges on the bark. Warty bark, which you can see on the far left, that's a species we learned last week. Um, oh no, actually, that's a that's um, that's a different species. That's a coastal species. We won't learn. Um, we talk about we've already talked about braided bark, and then we'll talk about shreddy bark. So we'll see. Let's look at some examples of these. Um, these are more gestalt characters that are descriptive, and so um, they can be very useful for identification. So let's look at a few examples. So on the far left, we've got Liriodendron tulipifera, and this is, we would call that ridged bark, right? You can see vertical ridges running up and down. You have shreddy bark found on Juniperus virginiana um, that is a mature tree, so that develops over time. The third one from the left is an example of shortleaf pine, which we need to find on campus. And so the bark for shortleaf is divided into plates. This is also the case for loblolly pine. And then on the far right, this is an example of mature bark for a black cherry tree, Prunus serotina. And you can see how it's the bark started out pretty smooth and you can still see those horizontal lenticels, but then it goes into flakes. Right, so we have tulip tree, eastern red cedar, shortleaf pine, and black cherry. I'm glad I got all those right. And then let's look at some other examples. So on the far left, um, this is a tree we had from this week. So a little review there. Celtis levigata, right? So we might call that warty bark. You would describe the second one on the left. This is a classic northern red oak bark, which has got ski trails, right? Or these flattened ridges or stripes on the tree. We have on the third from the left, persimmon, which has a very dark and cobbled bark over time. And then I think the one on the right is Ostrea virginica. That's a, bark, a tree that we'll learn that's got very shreddy bark. We sometimes call it cats, describe it as cat scratch bark. Okay, yes. So yeah, hop hornbeam is another word for Ostrea. Okay, so very simple. Trees can take on two different growth forms, right? This is a pretty short lecture. X current with the central leader or D current or deliquescent with the spreading growth form. Um, this is something I didn't talk about, so I'll, I'll take the opportunity to talk about it now. So the tree's allocation of energy to, of growth energy to roots versus shoots is determined early on, depending on the environmental conditions where that seedling is growing. And so you have trees that, and think about this, this will make sense. So if you, tree that, if you have a tree that's growing in the open, right? So on a farm field or if you plant it in an open area in your house, the tree does not, have any shortage of sunlight. So it might put a lot of its energy into growing roots, 
and then growing a very spreading canopy. And then if the tree is growing in a closed forest where it's shaded, that tree needs to get to the canopy as quickly as possible to try and get its leaves to be competitive, to get its leaves into the sunlight. So in that case, it might allocate more of its energy to growing shoots. So, and it tends to have a much straighter and narrower crown. Um, so that can affect the growth form. Really interesting uh, because once that growth, once that allocation of roots to shoots energy is set, it does not change throughout the tree's lifetime. So if I have a tree that starts out in, the, in a dark forest and I cut everything down around it, it will not suddenly grow a growth uh, near Academy. Likewise, you can go to Umstead State Park and you can see these old trees that clearly were by homesteads and started out in the open and have these giant spreading canopies. Lots of trees have grown up around them, but the tree continues to have that spreading canopy. Um, function of tree stems or bowls, they provide support for leaves and branches, they carry water, nutrients, and food, and they also are good for storage. The xylem, right, this should be reviewed, transports water and minerals up to the canopy. And the phloem, right, on the outside, the, just in between the inner bark and the outer bark, transports food from the leaves to the rest of the tree. And then the order of um, features anatomy is important. Right, trees in cross section have bark, right, going from the outside in, and then an inner bark, which is the phloem, then the vascular cambium, then the sapwood, which is active xylem, and then finally the heartwood, which is inactive xylem. And that's a wrap. <laughs>